I'm really excited to talk to you. I've read your books for years and your mm. latest is Don't Hold Back. And you're talking about unity in the church, which is such a necessary topic. So talk about the journey that really led you to write this book and some of the concerns you've seen in the American church that prompted it. Yeah, so uh, especially over the last five years, pastoring in Metro DC, I've just seen um, specifically when it comes to unity, uh, a, a picture in the church where we are, instead of being eager to unite around Jesus, we've been quick to divide over what I would call the idolatry of personal and political convictions. And um, I'm just zealous to see the church uh hold together around the beauty of Jesus alone on a whole nother level than where we would place some of our uh, strong convictions about a variety of different things that are less clear in God's word. And so uh, part of the reason I, I titled the book, uh, Don't Hold Back, Leaving Behind the American Gospel to Follow Jesus Fully is just because I, I think if we're not careful, we can exchange a biblical gospel that exalts Jesus above everything in this world for um, what I'm calling an American gospel that I think prostitutes Jesus, uses Jesus for the sake of comfort and power and politics and prosperity in the world. What is the American gospel and what are the pitfalls associated with continuing to succumb to this gospel that is not biblical? Mm. Well, when I when I put that subtitle on there, I is a is a deliberate play on a, a book that I wrote a decade ago, Radical Taking Back Your Faith in the American Dream. Uh, and I just talked about in that book about how we're tempted uh to settle for a nice, comfortable Christian spin on the American dream. Um, but after pastoring, especially these last five, six years in Metro DC. I'm convinced it was more than just a dream. Like there's there's core beliefs, ideals, values that we've united around that are not necessarily the core of the gospel. Um, and that's that's why when I when I talk about how if we're not careful, we can instead of uniting around Jesus, divide over the idolatry of personal and political convictions. That it just shows that. If we're not careful, we can conflate the gospel with American ideals and values and power and politics and in the process lose the way of Jesus. Like he he is has called us to well, just his who he is and what he's called us to is so much bigger than what we are tempted to get caught up with in this world, and particularly in my country, with uh the pursuit of comfort and power and politics and prosperity here. And I'm not saying uh, politics aren't important or uh, I'm not saying, uh, well, comfort is all bad, but I would say we've been called to follow a king who uh, beckons us to die to ourselves in this world and to live for another world altogether, not to live for uh, a country that one day, like all other countries, is going to fall uh, mm. and to live for a kingdom that's going to last forever. And that changes the way we live here. Yeah. How do we get to this place? And has it always been this way? Or have you seen this problem increasing in recent years? I think, um, I think it's probably been there in ways that have been exposed in really clear uh, pictures over the last few years as we have walked through political, cultural turmoil. Um, I think it's exposed uh, fractures that were underneath the surface. I mean, the, re the reality is for hundreds of years, we have uh, segregated by, it's one of the things I talk about in the book, by the color of our skin, even in churches. And uh, so that's not a new thing, uh, but uh, I think some of the tensions, racial tensions, even in the church, have been brought to the surface by 
uh, a variety of things over the last couple of years in ways that I hope are uh, triggers to help us see that we're created for so much more. Like Jesus has made multi-ethnic beauty possible for us in the church. And we can actually turn the tide on centuries of racial division in the church if we're willing to take steps toward that end. So what are some of these steps we can take? And you do outline them so well in the book, but just sort of summarize what these steps are. Well, I, I try to cast a vision in this book, like a forward looking picture of uh, fighting for, not with each other as brothers and sisters in Christ and turning the tide on centuries of racial division and really working to cultivate multi-ethnic community in the church. Um, I try to cast a vision for holding fast to God's word, like with, with conviction, including the hardest parts, the parts that are most unpopular in our culture, while loving everybody around us, including people who disagree strongly with us, loving them with compassion. Um, I try to, to dive into what does it look like for us to not just be known for debating justice, but actually doing it in a world full of all kinds of injustice when we're called to that all over scripture. And, uh, and then a, a picture where instead of living and, and don't get me wrong by any means, I, I'm so thankful for, for so much grace living in the country that I live in. Um, at the same time, our, our purpose on the planet is not to promote the greatness of our nation. It's to spread the gospel to all nations. And we have more opportunities than ever before in history to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth today than any other uh, people have ever had. So let's take those to the full. And uh, in all this, I think one of my biggest concerns is to, to call the church to see that Jesus is not a means to an end. Like he, he is the end. He is the one. Uh, God himself is the goal of the gospel. And uh, and if we're not careful, we can subtly look to him as a means to a variety of other ends that will fall far short of what our hearts were created to find satisfaction in. Yeah. But David, in your book, and I found this really helpful, you use an example of three buckets to explain what issues should be non-negotiables for Christians and what are not. How can we discern this? And can you sort of explain this bucket analogy a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So basically, uh, take our convictions. Let's put them in three buckets. The first bucket would be uh, the things that we hold most tightly to as followers of Jesus. Uh, this is the gospel. This is the authority of God's word, that which is clear and direct in God's word. Uh, so we hold most tightly to that. Like We give our lives for those convictions. Then kind of second bucket would be convictions that unite us together in local churches. So I realize... Um, yeah, the church I pastor here in Metro DC uh, operates according to certain convictions, and not every Christian has the exact same convictions. Like there are, I have brothers and sisters in Christ who baptize babies. We don't baptize babies. Uh, I mean, that just there's so many different examples, and so uh, we separate into different churches based on the, some of those convictions, and that's fine. We still unite together as brothers and sisters in Christ, but we're in different churches. So that's kind of the second bucket. And then the third bucket would be things that even in the same church we would agree to disagree about. Uh, or things like how the end times might play out, or just a variety of other uh, convictions we might have even in our lives. And it doesn't mean we don't hold to those with, with strong conviction, but one of the things I try to do in the book is, is develop out how, one, we need to make sure we know which beliefs go in which bucket. Like when I was uh, pastoring here in D.C. In, in 2020, and I heard people saying, well, you can't be a Christian and vote for Right. Fill in the blank. And I heard different people putting different names in the blank. And I was like, wait a second. You can't be a Christian. Like we just took how you vote in political election in 2020 in the United States of America and put that in the same bucket that we put, like the atonement of Jesus and the Trinity. No, this is these are not the same. Mm -hmm. And uh and so we need to be careful not to to mix those buckets and then careful to remember how to love people who have convictions in, in different buckets. So, I mean, that's certainly within the church, like 
there's a, it's good for us to be in community, in meaningful community with other brothers and sisters in Christ who may not have the same convictions in a local church as us. It's fine to be in different churches and still be united together in Christ. And it's fine to disagree about third bucket issues, even in our local church. I think about in our church, well, people had passionate disagreements about how they voted um, in that election, but they still held together in Christ. I mean, we, we just had a group walk through like an eight week journey where they, they were walking through different political and justice issues where they had very different opinions and they're sharing those opinions passionately and uh, sometimes with tears, but they're doing it with their Bibles open. They know their brothers and sisters in Christ. They walk out with their arms around each other, having understood each other better, maybe having persuaded others, maybe not being persuaded, but they're still united together in Christ in ways that supersede some of the issues that they were talking about. And then even people who don't agree on the first bucket issues on the authority of God's word or the gospel, uh, i.e. non-Christians, like God has clearly called us to, to love them well. So how do we make sure to keep those buckets separate uh, and, and distinct? And then how do we remember how to love one another across buckets? Yeah. Well, I am dyed in the wool PCA. And listen, I still love you, even though. There you go. That's great. <laughs> that's good. Well, then, yeah, it's a perfect example. Like, yes, we're going to. And that's what I love about Romans 14 and 15. Paul talks about how it's good to have strong convictions about baptism, for example, and to hold tightly to that, but not at the same level we hold on to the gospel like there's there's a level of priority there that we need to and that's why he says in romans 15 just a call for a unity around the hope we have mm -hmm. in jesus and for understanding with one another on some of these second or third tier issues how can pastors have discernment when addressing political issues from the pulpit when to address when not to address what to address mm, i think the the key for me as a pastor is to make sure where the Bible speaks clearly and directly, that I'm speaking clearly and directly. And uh, so an example of that for me would be, I mean, for years I was silent about abortion and I just kind of saw that as a political issue. And then and I was reading Psalm 139 one day and I'd read it before, but God just opened my eyes in a fresh way. This is a biblical issue far before it's a political issue. And uh, I mean, what God is doing to create children in the womb. And so began to preach on that and have ever since then. Um, so, but, but that's, that's not the only issue of justice that God addressed in his word. I mean, we see hundreds of references to the poor, the oppressed, to care for widows, to care for orphans, to care for the uh, sojourner. Like we could, we could go on and on and on with other things. And so let's make sure that's where, I, uh, and I write about this some in the book, have been particularly convicted. I've been selective. And I think many times we as pastors, if we're not careful, can be selective about the issues we will address or won't address from the word based sometimes on the political party that most people in our church may align with. And that's where we've got to be really, really careful that the world's not setting the agenda for what we're preaching and teaching, but it really is God's word that's setting that agenda. So oh, one part of your book that I found really uh, convicting was your call uh, to Christians to actively participate in missions. So talk a little bit more about this. Why is this our biblical mandate and not just live as a hashtag blessed Christian? Yeah, so, well, I mean, we've been given a clear command, like all of us have been given a clear command, make disciples of all the nations. And and that's a specific command of all the peoples of the world. Like that's where all of history is headed, Revelation 5, Revelation seven every nation tribe people language gathered around the throne of god that's where all of history is headed so how are you and i how are every single one of us as followers of jesus living for that purpose to see disciples made in every nation i mean if we're followers of jesus we have the spirit of jesus inside of us the spirit of jesus wants all the nations for jesus so we want all the nations for jesus this is not just for a few people this is every christian and uh, and so that's what I write about in the, in the book is what would it look like if we were all living for that purpose in all the different places where we live, in all the different situations, roles, jobs we have, um, especially in a world where, okay, if we've been commanded to make disciples of all the nations, and there are 3 billion people today who have little to no access to the gospel, 
in thousands of distinct ethnic groups that are unreached by the gospel. Well, that's not just an issue for a few Christians to think about, like a select group of missionaries who actually care about that. Like, no, that's for every follower of Jesus. Surely it's not tolerable for us to live in a world where there are three billion people who have little to no access to the gospel. And surely God is not saying, let me get a few people to care about that and kind of work toward that. No, this is for all of us to, and I, I try to walk through in the book, like what does this look like practically in our in our lives as uh, singles, as moms, as dads, and in all kinds of work in all kinds of different domains. But how can we live to be a part of spreading the gospel to all the nations. This is what we're made for. It's where all of history is headed. And if we want our lives to count, if the train of history is headed toward all the nations worshiping Jesus, then we need to jump on that train and we need to live for that purpose. And and that's part of what I'm trying to communicate in this book is that uh, like we're created for so much more than just promoting the greatness of our nation or trying to preserve the greatness of our nation. And I'm not saying that there's not uh, there's not value in, in a variety of ways to that, but we're created for so much more to make disciples of all the nations. This is this should be driving all of our lives as followers of Jesus. Yeah. That's good. Well, David, what ultimately is your hope for this book? What do you hope after readers consume these words? Um, what do you hope that they they feel, they believe, they tangibly do? Well, I, I hope one, they'll be encouraged. Like I, I wrote this book, I, I, I dedicated in the beginning to discourage, discouraged and disillusioned and divided Christians. Uh, and most importantly, the next generation who I think uh, at many points has looked around at the church over the last few years and, and just thought, I thought there was more to Jesus than this. And I thought there was more to the church than this. Like I, I wrote this book to say there is, there is so much more to Jesus and so much more than the church to the church. And we can experience it or better put, we can experience him and like we can experience awe, fill and wonder in Jesus and the otherworldly beauty of the church. But some things need to be different, uh, not just in those people out there, but starting in us. And so try to walk in the book through what, so through issues we need to dive into if things are going to be different. And then in the end, I, I try to close with just some practical encouragement based on those issues, just some practical steps to take, whether it's how, how can we cultivate community on earth like it's going to be in heaven? How can we experience the multi-ethnic beauty of the church? How can we make sure we're seeking God, not as a means to an end, but as the end? How can we be intentional about showing counter-cultural compassion in the world and doing justice in a world of injustice. And like we were talking about reaching the unreached with the gospel in each of our lives. So I just try to give some practical handles on what does that look like? I think I'd describe it as just six steps to a different future that I, that I hope people can take away from this book. Yeah. 